So I was in the process of updating my computer and getting rid of uh, older files and things like that. And uh, also kind of doing something with my bookmarks too. Uh, my computer's been running slower than usual lately. So I, I just, once I get started on one task, I, I go to doing a million of them. But I found this old bookmark uh, that I had done, that I had set aside for a video and I never did it, but it was about right in the middle of the 2020 pandemic, they were talking about how Zoom meetings weren't the real program of recovery and how people were getting second rate spirituality <laughs> from Zoom meetings and how that there was, this was going to be a problem for people because, and you know how AA is, they always got to tout the, you know, the people die and thing when it suits them. They they rejoice when relapsers die. They say some have to die so that others can live. But then when the when the situation calls for it, they talk about people will die. And of course, this article is one of those articles. People will die because there's Zoom meetings. Uh, and of course, what I was thinking to myself when looking at this is it's probably uh, more difficult for old timers to bully and intimidate people and uh, gaslight them on a Zoom meeting. You know, you can always just click the camera and turn it off when they're getting on your nerves too bad. It's kind of different when you're when you're stuck in a real AA meeting. And I don't know what those unfortunate people that are forced and coerced to go on AA did during that whole entire real severe lockdown situation. Uh, hopefully they had to go to Zoom meetings and they could mute the microphones, you know. Or that, something like I would have done back then. I'd have had me a bottle of liquor right there by the Zoom meeting. <laughs> mute the microphone, take a drink, and keep on going. Unless you're in drug court, which I can. I did a video on that. You can't get away with anything in that. But it, it got me to thinking about how the AA old-timers, and I've talked about this before, they have a nostalgia for a time where old-timers had unfettered cruelty to practice upon newcomers and there was this golden era where they got to step over people dying in the streets of alcohol poisoning so they could go get sober, even though it's a loving, caring, spiritual, altruistic program, right? But I remember when I first got exposed to it in 2002, there was this big deal that they would, that they would put out about how many people in this room have ever actually been on a 12-step call. Uh, if you've been on a 12-step call, you need to just raise your hand right now. And of course... You know, I never raised my hand because I was one of these people that had a million white chips and a couple of 90-day chips and all that other kind of shit, and I really wasn't considered part of the in crowd. Uh, but, uh, you know, I remember there'd be one or two people that'd put their hands up, and there'd be a bunch of old-timers that would share these stories about how they went into a bar or how they went into a beer joint to pull a drunk out and save his life, and they were shot at and stabbed and you know whatever whatever embellishment they need to make up at the moment to, to make their tale a little bit grander than it probably really was but i actually had been on some 12-step calls and i can tell you that these this uh mental image like they used to hang up in the aa meetings of the two guys sitting next to the drunk guy on the bed or these two caring drunks that are trying to save someone's life is like everything else in aa it's complete and total bullshit um <clears throat> I remember in particular one time there was a there was this old tradition I think it was I don't know if it's still practiced I mean or whatever but it supposedly uh, it was two old timers would grab a new guy and drag him along on the call to supposedly make him grateful to be sober I don't, I don't know what it was but I remember at the time I'd only the very first twelve step call I ever went on I only had like like three weeks uh, without being on a severe drunken bender. And I don't know about everybody else, but when I used to get on severe drunken benders, after I got through the physical thing, like for a month afterward, I'd always be kind of a nervous wreck. I mean, like if, if I was walking down the street and a car would drive by me and the sound was up too loud, I'd kind of tense like that. Or if I was, uh, you know, if I if I heard a loud motorcycle when I, when it passed by me, my, I would get all nervous. Loud noises bothered me. I was always really anxious. Usually used to take me about a month or two before I got to kind of feeling normal again, but I got dragged along to a 12-step call in one of those states. And the, the situation, I remember just how disgusted I was with everything because the situation was a guy who had got drunk and he had driven to his parents' house and apparently he had passed out on a couch. And, uh, you know, we get there and the dad's being a complete fucking asshole about the whole entire thing. No drunk man's going to sleep on my couch, you know. Oh, yeah, you're a real tough badass, you know. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You're just a glowing example of pure masculinity, aren't you, you bastard? This is what I was thinking to myself at the time. But he was going on and on about how he wasn't going to let the son sleep there. But the dilemma was he couldn't necessarily throw him out. 
uh, because he only had one means of transportation, the way he had driven there, and for him to drive away, he would have driven drunk. So I don't know what he was expecting these old-timers to do, but these old-timers, of course, took the opportunity to wake the guy up who's still plastered out of his mind, and they, you know, were reading him the riot act, and when they weren't reading him the riot act, they were telling some grandiose tale to the parents about what they had done back in the day. This was, this was just another extension of an AA meeting. This is an opportunity for these people to blow their horns and, 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 and act like that they deserve to be on some kind of fucking pedestal for something. There was one guy who said, well, before I got sober, my, uh, my mother used to sleep with her purse underneath her pillow. That's what kind of person I was before I got sober. And I'm like, and uh, this is supposed to matter in context to this situation. How exactly? But, but because neither one of these old timer assholes was going to drive him someplace, they ended up calling the police, which was totally unnecessary, and having the guy hauled away to something like that mobile crisis horse shit that uh, I talked about in a video being taken to, which, again, I was thinking, well, you know, these these stories you hear about these 12-step calls, this is the reality of those things. And, of course, a couple of nights later, these old-timers were in this meeting, and they were talking about how they had given this drunk guy a place to sleep. Uh, because that's what you do in AA. Hi helping new people is the highlight of your day. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't give the guy a place to sleep. You called the cops on him and had him hauled away to some fucking inhumane drunk tank uh, while you were uh, blabbering about what a badass drunk you were back in the day to the parents who probably don't even give a shit anyway. Not that I felt much sympathy for the asshole abusive dad, who's probably the reason why the dude was a, was a drunk. <laughs> That was one 12-step call I went on. I remember there was one in particular that I got dragged along to because supposedly uh, it was supposed to be some big deal, like if an AA old-timer was dying, uh, to, you know, to go visit the AA old-timer, that this was considered spiritual step work or something like that. So I got hauled along with these two older-timers to this place where this old-timer guy was, and he was in hospice care, <clears throat> meaning that, uh, yeah, he was on his... He was, he was dying. And we get to the place, and I remember it was pouring down rain outside. It was freezing cold, and I, I could think of a million places I wanted to be other than there. I was, again, I hadn't been sober more than a couple of weeks at the time, and I just wasn't feeling, feeling like I wanted to be in, involved in this. Because I didn't want to be there with this hospice care place, that I was just selfish and self-centered, and blah, 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 blah. You, you know the drill by now. And we get inside... And there were these big signs everywhere about no smoking anywhere on the premises. And there were these big signs about, you know, no more than two packets of sugar per coffee or something like that. And I made a bad mistake of saying, well, you know, these people are dying. Uh, why don't they just let them smoke cigarettes, drink alcohol, or do whatever they want to do? I mean, they are dying after all. And of course, I was admonished severely for this. Well, you know, you only think that way because you're a selfish, self-centered alcoholic who only cares about himself. Like, if you were dying, you'd want to smoke and drink alcohol. That's what you're all about. <laughs> so, I watched these two old-timers. They're talking to this hospice nurse who you could tell is just barely trying to be polite. And one of them is talking about, yeah, I almost ended up in a place just like this uh, back in the days when I used to shoot dope all the time. You know, I'm one of the first people that actually used to inject myself with LSD back in the day. And, <laughs> like, you know, the topic at hand here talking to this nurse has nothing to do with you. But leave it to you to jump on, uh, to, to jump into the conversation some kind of way and twist it all around where you can talk about your horror stories as a big badass way back in the day. And, you know, and it, you know, there was a part of me even back then that was thinking, this is a hospice nurse you're talking to. I'm pretty sure she's probably seen a whole lot worse than anything you can come up with with all your to stories about shooting LSD. <laughs> why does it, why do you assume anybody cares? <laughs> but anyway, they, they held up the staff, mainly telling badass stories about themselves and mainly doing the same old spiels and the same old extensions of what they do in AA meetings. We finally got into the room to see the guy, and he was practically in a coma. He was awake for all of maybe two seconds, and then he was back unconscious again, and uh, we ended up leaving. And, of course, I was told that this was going to help me in my sobriety if I could overcome my selfishness and think about more people who were a whole lot more unfortunate than myself. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you just took this trip as an opportunity to do nothing but talk about yourselves to these nurses who I'm sure had work to do and I'm sure have seen a whole lot worse 
than anything that you could come up with with these made up tales of DUIs and LSD injections, you know. But anyway, later on that night, of course, they were they were doing the crocodile tear thing, and even one of them had a tissue paper in his hand. He's like, it was so painful to uh, it was so painful to walk in there and see that guy dying like that. They were in the room, by the way, with him for all of maybe a minute. Uh, it was funny. I was actually in the room before they were, but I'm not wanting brownie points for that or anything. But they were they literally walked in there, looked at the guy. Hello, how are you doing? Oh, he's not awake right now. Walk right back out there, holding their fucking handkerchiefs, and they're talking about, yeah, you know, all they don't make old timers like that anymore. Why? One of the things he said to us when he woke up in the hospice care was he wasn't going to take any pain medication. And, you know, I, some of you new people in here that think you got it so bad, you know, oh, you should just go out there and drink again if, if that's the kind of attitude you got because we just spent the day with a real recovering alcoholic who's facing death and who's... And I'm like, so you took a tragedy of someone dying and you spun it around to make it all about you, and you added in a bunch of lies and tall tales to make the tale better than it, than it really was, and you didn't give a flying fuck about the old guy dying. You just wanted everyone to know that you were there, and you wanted everyone to believe that you had some deep emotional catharsis in seeing this take place. But ultimately what I found, because I went on several of them, and I, I, I'm not going to repeat them all here, but I think you get the general idea of what I'm talking about is that this whole idea that there was this uh, sacred time in AA, this golden age when people really gave a shit about one another and when people really uh, went down there in the gutters and really uh, struggled to pull the dying alcoholic out of the gutter is like everything else that AA does. It's a bunch of bullshit. It's a bunch of made up bullshit to try to browbeat and intimidate the new people into thinking they missed some golden era of AA that never existed at all. And it just occurred to me that they, they, they're going to do the same fucking thing with this Zoom meeting shit, you know. There was even a comment on this old article I was looking at that said, well, unlike all these people that are afraid of the sniffles, we have a deadly disease we're battling. We're battling the disease of alcoholism. Well, the deadly disease of alcoholism, uh, all you got to do if you're not shaking or if you're not alcohol dependent, need some alcohol to kind of maintain, to keep you from going to the DTs, if you're cold stone sober and you're not dependent on alcohol, the deadly disease of alcoholism can be put to a stop by not drinking. <laughs> Doesn't require you sitting in a room full of people gaslighting them with your high-handed bullying and your sanctimonious made-up lies to try to talk about what a great person you were and how you witnessed this golden age that never actually ever existed. <clears throat> I mean, I'm aware that nostalgia, if that's what you want to call this sick, twisted thing that they got going on in AA, which I don't, uh, I'm aware that nostalgia is not unique to the human experience. I mean, if you cornered me on the street, some, well, not cornered me, but if you met me on the street somewhere and you got me started, I could probably tell you this long, wonderful tale about what a great time it was to be a teenager back in the 1990s and how awesome it was to be a kid back in the 1980s. I could tell you about arcades, I could tell you about the music, I could tell you about uh, record stores before they're, you know, I could tell you about all of these things, and I'm sure you really wouldn't give a shit, I'm sure it would give me kind of a high to talk about what I would perceive as a better time, when in truth I'm just missing being young, <laughs> but, but th that's not the same level of nostalgia as what I think I see going on in AA, in AA it's almost made or talked about in this shame-based way to make the new people feel like you really missed out on what the real program of Alcoholics Anonymous is. And of course, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter if they introduced 12-step calls tomorrow again and they dragged every new guy off to another 12-step call where they could do the same type of behaviors that I'm sure a lot of other people on here have seen. It wouldn't matter if they could bring all that back or if they could bring back the glory days of stepping over dying people in gutters they would still continually abuse you by telling you that you don't know what the real program of Crackaholics Anonymous is really all about. And you just completely missed out on all the lovely, glorious days where you could bully people and beat up people and silence people and intimidate people. And supposedly all this was done in the name of saving lives. But I never have exactly figured out how that uh, you being a bullying asshole and a sanctimonious prick who believes the whole world revolves around them, uh, really even has any consideration or care for saving lives. But anyway, uh, I had some downtime. I thought I would do one of these. So uh, that's until next time. Later.